slow motion, I could see the window slowly rolling down and this arm come out and just boop. I just saw this f figure, I knew it was a male, and just light, and it's sparkly, and gave me peace, and I knew I wasn't going to die. I was hearing people talk about how Jesus took the desire to use away. I literally had that born again experience where my eyes were open. This conversation, and she's like, There is no God. And he's like, There has to be a God. And they're just going back and forth. And all of a sudden, they both were silent. And they turned around and looked at me and said, What do you believe, Lori? And I went, I just started crying. And I was like, I know the truth. I know that Jesus is Lord. Well, Sister Lori, thank you so much for talking to us today. My first question to you is, how did you meet God? How did I meet him? Uh, my first encounter, well, because I didn't really believe in God when I grew up. I was raised Catholic and not even a good Catholic, but my parents sent me to Catholic school and high school. And uh, I was, when I was growing up, I tried to do really good. Like I wanted to please my parents and, but my dad was very abusive and I might know like Asian, <laughs> like kind of a perfectionistic um, upbringing appearance um, and so I got really good grades in school I was doing good but you know I I would come home and I would have like all A's and one B and the focus would be on the B why'd you get why didn't you get you know why'd you only get a B in whatever and um, and then when they told me they were gonna send me a Catholic school I was not happy. <laughs> I was mad <laughs> because I felt like it was a punishment, you know, and um, I went and, uh, well, I had no choice. They sent me to Catholic school and I thought maybe I could, I could do it, you know, but then uh, the rules, the rules, you know, I had to wear a skirt, you know, it couldn't be six inches above the knee. Um, just strict and that was my first experience of having any kind of knowledge about God besides my grandmother who knew the Lord but she she didn't like beat it down you know my throat or anything but but the Catholic school really turned me off to God mm -hmm. and um I thought, if this is the way God is, I don't want to have anything to do with him. Uh, and I became very angry. Like, well, uh, aside from my dad being abusive and then um, just the rules, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do it. <laughs> it's like, okay, I'm going to go to hell and I'm going to earn my way to do it. You know, I'm going to make it worth it. And so I... Join. I started hanging out with uh, with inner city kids because when I grew up, like in junior high and grammar school, it was with uh, like all white, you know, pretty much all white school. Then when I went to Catholic school, they bust people in from the inner city, and um, so then there was like all different races and. A lot of, um, I'm part Filipino um, and Japanese, and w well, a lot of Filipinos went to the Catholic school, and I was like, oh, okay. So then I started hanging around with them and got very, uh, was, that was when I first started to rebel because <laughs> I had tried to be good growing up but then 
then all of a sudden it was like because of all the rules it was like brought that rebellion out of me and I was like yeah I started um and my parents always said you better not smoke cigarettes and you're gonna do drugs and I'll like, you know like my parents don't know what they're talking about but I started smoking cigarettes, then I started smoking weed, then I started drinking, you know? It was just like, oh my gosh, my parents were right. But, um, yeah. How old were you then? Uh, 15. Wow. Yeah. And uh, I just got real... Oh, then I started hanging out with the Filipino friends that in that time, in the 80s, was when they um, break dancing had mm -hmm. come out. And... So they would like break dance, but then break dancing very not too long after became gangs. I mean, like, you know, they would have crews and people would like break dance and have these, you know, uh, I forgot what you call them, like rivaling, you know. And then afterwards, we'd end up getting in fights. And then pretty soon the fights became, you know, with knives and baseball bats. And then pretty soon, then it was guns so then there was no break dancing there was just fighting <laughs> so so that probably was the very first time I ever encountered God was when uh I was in a drive-by shooting and I got shot how old were you and when you got shot? I was by this time I was seven no I was 20 but okay I skipped there's a, my story is so long um I during the time of being in the gang I I ended up marrying one of the leaders when I was 17 and then um when uh I was trying to get away from him but uh he asked me <laughs> He asked me to go to a party, and he knew the way I was because there was this one chick that was going there, and I wanted to, like, you know, um, I had made a vow, actually, if I ever see this girl, I'm going to blah, 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 you know. And um, so he asked me if I wanted to go to this party, and I was like, no, I'm trying to stay out of trouble. And he goes, oh, but so-and-so is going to be there. And I was like, <laughs> so I was like, Okay, well, maybe, all right, I'll go. So I went, and it was just, like, perfect. You know, that Satan would knew that my pride would get me going to this party. But I went, and, um, yeah, and then instead of me being able to beat up this girl, I get shot. <laughs> um, and it was crazy, because a week before that, I had a dream that I was going to get shot. And I was very anxious about going because I was like, I I asked one of my homeboys if I if I could take his gun. He had a nine millimeter. I'm like, can we take your gun? And he's like, no. And I'm like, I feel like something bad's gonna happen. But you know, we just yeah, he he wouldn't give it to me. <laughs> so we we ended up being the last ones, me and my friends, to going to the party. And then yeah, we we're. Um, sitting at like an island you know an mm -hmm. island in the mm -hmm. parking lot and I saw a car drive by with a black guy and a, a white girl and they were just like driving really slow like looking at everything and I was like oh my gosh they're totally scoping us out you know and um Five minutes later, a car of Filipinos came dri driving by, and it was like slow motion. I could see the window slowly rolling down, and this arm come out and just boom, boom, boom. And yeah. At you? Yeah, at all of us. Oh, me oh. And my homeboys. not just at yeah. you, but all. Yeah, okay. yeah. And my, my, one of my homeboys, um, Tony, he got shot, and then I got shot. And it went through my left arm through my side, um, just missed my heart, went through my liver, my lung, and my diaphragm, and got lodged in my back. It was a 38. And um, and I didn't even know, like, I mean, I knew I got shot, but like a, a lot of people say that when you get shot, it's like fire and burning. My arm just like went completely paralyzed, just dropped, and then, but I couldn't breathe because it went through my lungs, and I was like, <gasps> <laughs> but um yeah that that okay so my friends 
they saw like um, one of my homeboys. He pulled up my shirt, and the I, my friend said that you could see like uh, some. You could see the blood, but you could see like stuff like beating, you know. And so <laughs> my my girlfriend, she was screaming, and I was like, "Shut up!" And um, then this priest, because it was at a Catholic church. <sighs> Because the party was at a Catholic church. And so I'm laying there, and then this priest comes, and he has, like, holy water, and he's giving me my last rites. And I was like, excuse me, Father, but there's no effing way I'm going to die. I was so offended and mad that he was giving me my last rites. He assumed that was your last. Yeah, I'm going to die. And I'm like, excuse me, what are you doing? I'm not going to die. I'm still breathing. (laughs) Yeah, I was mad. But when we finally got me in the ambulance, that was the first experience I I had with God. I knew I was laying there, and they were putting, you know, hooking me all up with stuff. and, And all of a sudden, I just just had this realization without a shadow of a doubt. I'm like, I'm going to hell. Like, if I die, I am going to hell. <laughs> like, no doubt about it. I just knew. Nobody had to tell me. I just knew. And so I started going, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. <laughs> Sorry, that was our Father who in heaven. Because I didn't know how to pray. I was just, like, praying those prayers. And then... Um, I opened my eyes, and the EMT was sitting next to me, and then right next to him was, which I now believe was Holy Spirit, but I just saw this figure, I knew it was a male, and just, uh, I don't know how to explain it, just light, it's sparkly, and gave me peace, and I knew I wasn't going to die, and that's that was it, and... Um, yeah, but it didn't get me to, like, want to serve Jesus or anything. It was just, you know, I'm going to live. <laughs> I was like, okay, I had peace. And um, and I was in the hospital, I don't remember how long, almost a month maybe. Mm, wow. And, yeah, and Surgery. I had to. Surgery, oh, removed yeah. the bullets. Yeah. Right? Yeah, it was lodging in my back. And, yeah, they said if it was a hollow point, if it had been a hollow point, that I would be gone because it would just would have exploded, you know. Yeah, but um, but that was my first experience where with with actually starting to believe like there is a God because people when I was in Catholic school, you know, I remember one of my best friends said. Um, she was talking about God, and I was like, I don't believe in God. I go, there is a God. He's a bleep, bleep, bleep. And I I gave him the finger and said, you know, like, screw him. Mm. And she was just like, I can't believe you, you know. And then after I got saved, this is later, but I told her she needed Jesus that she was going to go to hell. <laughs> she was like, I'm going to hell. I've never been as bad as you. <laughs> but yeah, that's another story. But, but yeah, like I didn't I didn't believe in God. I just thought if if there was a God, he was a jerk. You know, a mean old man just waiting for me to screw to up. To punish you. Right. Yeah, cuz I think I thought he was like my earthly dad, yeah. you know, because that's yeah. That's really sad, right? Is that weird? Religion will bind people into doing rules and regulations, but not really guide people to encounter the a Lord relationship. relationship with the Lord. But so at the age of twenty, you got shot, and that was when the first time you encountered the Lord, Holy Spirit, God, yeah. and that's when He gave you peace and let you know that you won't die, that you will not die. But what's so interesting was that. You just knew while in the ambulance, you knew that you, if you die right now, you would go to hell. You Mm -hmm. just knew. Nobody had to tell you, right? And why God's grace and mercy, because in Jeremiah chapter 1, God said, I knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. His grace and mercy allow you to experience first encounter with him. Mm -hmm. So at the hospital for one month, recovering from surgery, what went through your mind while lying there? Nothing. I mean, well, not nothing, but I remember my homeboys came to see me one time, and I had 
you know, scar from here to here, and my arm was like in a sling. And when they took the stitches out, it looked like Frankenstein. And my, when my homeboys came to see me, one of them goes, "Ooh, it's Frankenstitch." <laughs> like, I was, but it was crazy because when he said that. Even though I laughed, it was like it made me very ashamed. And uh, I had a lot of shame about my appearance, the way it looked. And, and then I had the cast for five months because it went through the, my, the bone. And when I got the cast off, my arm was like this skinny. <laughs> Like, and my mom was with me when I went to get the cast taken off, and my mom started crying, and I'm like, why are you crying? And she goes, your arm is so skinny. And I was like, what? I wouldn't have even noticed until my mom started crying, and then I was crying, and then I was like, oh my gosh. I look, my, my mom said, I think she said I had a monkey arm or something. I don't know, but I was like, oh. So then more shame, and I was like, because growing up, I already felt kind of sh like a lot of shame because I was always like scrawny and skinny and, and you know, like olive oil, like <laughs> my friends teased me, you know. And so I, I, I think just growing up as a young person, it's easy to be like self-conscious about the way you look, but then, you know, you have people like tease you about things and then you get self-conscious mm -hmm. and then it's just really easy to, you know, get shame. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, I, I, I carried that for a long time. Yeah. So after you got released from the hospital, um, what was your life you walk with with the Lord, did you even thought about Jesus? Did you even <laughs> say, okay, well, he saved me, so maybe I should check out? No? No. I, I think a week after I got out of the hospital, I got in a fight with somebody. I had no, it was like, I knew that God saved me, but I had no desire to serve him. Mm -hmm. And it was just kind of like went in the back burner. And I just actually, if anything, I... I probably got worse be, than before I got better. It, it went a good, well, about a year later, one of my friends got saved radically. Mm. One of my homeboys that I lived with, he got radically saved. And he came home from church one day, and I had been up uh, all night. You know, I, I came home at like 7 in the morning. I'd gotten high all night. And he walked in, he was like, like, smiling, and I was like, dude, what'd you do? You, like, I want some. Well, I thought he, he would, did drugs, you know? And he was like, it's Jesus. And I was like, oh, God. <laughs> he was like, he's like, I got saved. I got, and I'm like, no, forget it. I don't want to hear it. Forget it. I asked. <laughs> so I was just like. And I didn't want to hear anything. He tried to witness to me so many times. We had big cocaine mirrors around the house and a big three-foot bong. And he started leaving tracks next to all of them. I'd be doing a line of cocaine. I'd be like, oh, what is this? <laughs> Reading it. But, yeah, I laughed at it. I thought it was, like, whatever. And uh, except for a year goes by, he's not doing drugs, and his life is changing. So I couldn't deny that, you know, and I was just like, wow, you know, I, I, I saw him change. And um, it was probably two years after I, I got saved. Well, by this time I was going to Hollywood like every day. Or, to party? Yeah. Yeah, and um, and then oh, there, there's just so much. I don't I don't want to be here for two days. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but um, yeah, I was living in downtown LA. I lived in Hollywood. I just all around. And then um, I I was doing so much drugs. Like I was able to get away from the gang, but. Um, 
Because all of the, uh, the, uh, the whole gang, everybody got really into drugs, all kinds of drugs, methamphetamine, cocaine, whatever crap. And so and where did you guys got the money to do all these drugs? Like where financially, how were you able to afford? Um, that's a good question. Well, I know when I was in Catholic school, I used to steal money from my parents, <laughs> but, um, well, Asian you know, like Asian, they usually have, you know, they're not broke. Most of them, you know what I mean? Like they stash had, somewhere. Yeah. Cash somewhere. Like, um, I'm trying to remember cause I was still a teenager, but, um, somehow we always had enough to, to like, I mean, it wasn't like we were doing a lot, you know, it wasn't like, uh, we did, but still. We fried on acid a lot, and that's cheap. That's only like that was like ten bucks a hit, you know. So we would we would do that every weekend. But um, yeah, I didn't get really really into cocaine until I um, started going to Hollywood. I started working at a, a hostess club, and um, where you you dance with these dirty old men and you get paid and then they tip you and um yeah you can make decent money you know tips mostly not off uh, hourly but um and then I met my first uh cocaine dealer there and yeah, after, after I met him, I didn't go to the hostess place because he, he supplied my habit. And, um, yeah. And then it wasn't How long. How old were you then? Uh, 20, 21, 22. So Ooh, still very young. <laughs> huh? Still very young. Yeah, I was still young. young. And, um, yeah, so um, I, was doing, uh, I was doing a lot of cocaine. And going to clubs and just, um, but I got pregnant. That's what, um, that's another long story. But I got pregnant and um, I tried to get an abortion. I had had an abortion before. It was not a big deal to me because I was raised that, even in Catholic school, that is just a fetus, just a cell, you know. They didn't even... I mean, I I look back now and I go, oh, it's Catholic school. You know, you would think that because they were so against abortion, but it was like I didn't see getting pregnant as actually having a child. Mm. And so, yeah, I was like, well, I'm going to abort this, you know. And um, I tried and I tried and I tried, and God just p kept putting roadblocks and finally, I was like five months pregnant, and I was freaking out. And I went to a Catholic church one day, and I was crying, and I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I can't have this baby. I don't want this baby. And my friend that got saved, he took me to an alternative to abortion place. It was a Catholic place. <laughs> and... Um, when when I met with one of the sisters, she was telling me the options, but the options were like, go to this home and um, have, uh, you know, go th basically go through the pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And I was like, there is no way. I was like, there is no way I am going to carry a baby for nine months and give it away. No. And I was mad and I walked out of there. I was so mad. And, and, um, and my friend was sharing his testimony with another nun. I was like, come on, get out of here. I don't want to hear this. But so about half a month, a half, half, yeah, about two weeks later, I think it was, um, it was just like, there was just so many things that, ha I mean, I, I did some horrible things. I won't even say what I did because I tried, I wanted to, get rid of the baby and but I could not get an abortion and um and I had my best friend had made me promise that I would not 
bring drugs to her boyfriend's party. She was having a party, and um, I promised, and I brought drugs anyway, and she found out, and she called me up, and she cussed me out. She was so mad, and she was like, I never want to talk to you again. I hate you, blah, blah, blah. And um, at that same night, I was planning on going to Hollywood. I was all dressed up. I thought it was all that. You know, I was getting ready to go out. And my friend called me and said his car broke down and couldn't pick me up. And I was like, oh. so my mom was had just became a Christian. She was going to church and she said, Lori, do you want to go to church with us? And I was like, church? And she goes, yeah, we're going to a 12-step meeting at church because she was married to an addict and remarried, not my dad. But so she goes, come on, you're all dressed up. You have nowhere to go. You should come with us. And I was like, oh, all right. So I went. Holy Spirit. I was like, they were talking in the meeting and they were all talking. It wasn't because I'd been to many AA meetings and and it was always focused on, you know, the drugs, the problem, whatever. And I was hearing people talk about how Jesus took the desire to use away and just her testimony after testimony. And by the time they got around to me, I was just a wreck. And I was like, <laughs> I was like and um, yeah, and my, my friend that got saved, he had told me, he goes, Lori, who needs to go? Because he tried to invite me to church. And I was like, no, I'm not going to church. Like, he's like, who needs to go to church? The person who's well, or no, who needs to... Who needs to go to the doctor? The one who's sick or the one who's well? And I'm like, the one who's sick. And he goes, it's the same thing. Like, like who needs to take a shower? You know, the one who's clean or the one who's dirty? You know, because I'm like, I'm dirty, you know? And and he's like, no, you, that's the way. You need to just come, you know? And um, and I remember telling that, and I was like, <laughs> I was crying and... Um, yeah, it, God really touched me, and then I went home, and then my friend called me and cussed me out and told me she never wanted to talk to me again, and I was like, what am I doing? What have drugs ever done for me, you know? I've hurt so many people, and my mom had her um, <clears throat> Bible on her coffee table, and uh, it had stuff to look up when you... Um, uh, need forgiveness mm -hmm. and it was Isaiah 118 for though your sins may be are scarlet I'll make them white as mm -hmm. snow and then Psalm 51 mm -hmm. you know give me mm -hmm. a clean heart and I read it and I was like God forgive me for everything I tried to remember everything that I had ever done and I was like save me and I will Deliver me from drugs, and I will I will serve you ever, for the rest of my life. And I woke up and a new person. But I'd like to end it there. But yeah, you're gonna need to do another video or something. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm, it is way too long. So I you woke have, up a new person. The my mom gone. was just like. My mom was like. What's wrong with you? You're like doing dishes. Like, it was like crazy. She was like, You use this place as a hotel. Like, you know, you just come and eat and leave. And, you know, but yeah, I like, I literally had that born again experience where my eyes were open, where I was like, I noticed ants on the ground. It was like I had glasses. I'm like, wow, there's like leaves on the, on the trees. <laughs> like, like, literally, I felt like I had spiritual glasses mm -hmm. and I could see and it was just like I just loved and everything had changed and and I quit smoking cigarettes and and drinking and cocaine everything just went like that radical salvation <sighs> but you know and I I was on fire for God I served God I mean I I best I could I started going to church I didn't even know what being born again was until I went to church and the pastor said um John 3 3 unless a man be born again he will not see the kingdom of God and he and then he started talking about being born again and I was like 
I think that's where I am. <laughs> it's like, that's where I am, huh? I mean, I was all excited because, you know, and um, yeah, it was like really cool. Like, it just, I started memorizing scripture. I went and first job I got was working in a Christian um, bookstore. I read everything. I just was like reading, reading, reading. And it was just, it was, it was awesome. Did you read the Bible that time? Finish yeah, reading the yeah, entire yeah. Bible from beginning to end? No, I, I read, I don't, no, I didn't go from beginning to end. I just read like whatever I felt led to mm -hmm. read, but I read, I studied like, I, I just had access to so many books. I just read everything like, and, um, and one of the first books I read was, um, he came to set the captives free. Have you, do you know that book? Mm. Oh, okay. By, um, Dr. Rebecca Brown. And it's a true story about, she's a doctor and, uh, she worked at a hospital and there was a lot of, um, uh, witches that worked there and she ministered to somebody that was in the satanic brotherhood and it's an amazing book and mm. so because when I first got saved I had visitations like say like demons. really yeah so I didn't have to be convinced that the devil you just knew. <laughs> like yeah you I just like knew. I had yeah experiences with saw them whatever and so it wasn't like something you yeah. know so when I read that book, I was like, yeah, you know, and on fire, like, but I didn't realize that the enemy is very personal mm -hmm. and he hates us and wants mm -hmm. us dead. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> just like, mm -hmm. and he's patient too, mm -hmm. you know, he's mm -hmm. not going to like give up easily. No, mm -hmm. he doesn't. But he might step back for a little mm -hmm. while, you know, and mm -hmm. give you a minute. But yeah, so waiting for a more opportune mm -hmm. time. And, uh, so I went from, I went from, uh, really seeking God, but if there's just things, I mean, I can look back now and just, I, I ended up, I ended up getting married to this guy that I had been sleeping with. Like he got saved a week after I did. And he was like, I think God wants us to get married. And I was like, I don't know. How old were you then? Uh, 22. Okay. So still very young in their yeah. early 20s. And I was like, I, I knew I didn't even love him. You know what I mean? But I'm like, maybe this is what Christians do. They just get married and have kids. Like, I didn't know the, the abundant life, you know? I just thought, well, so, um, yeah, I remember I had like major premarital. I was just like, I do not want to get married to this person, you know, but I did it. Because everybody's like, that's normal, you know. Now I know different. But, yeah, so we got married. And then uh, when, and then I went to beauty college and started doing hair. And it's a very worldly environment. And it was, it was um, you know, working on people, celebrities and in industry, you know, uh, just very worldly. And... Um, and one of my coworkers asked me if I wanted to, to go to a club because her husband was in a band. And, and I was like, oh, okay. So I went and that was the beginning of the end. But, um, but that was after I had my son. And when I had my son, it was really hard because it wasn't an expectant. I wasn't expecting to get pregnant. I don't know what I was thinking, but you know, when I found out I was pregnant, I was like, I don't want, I don't want a baby right now because I was too selfish, you know? And, um, but once I had my son, I was so happy, but it was just still too much. I, they gave me, um, because when I had him, he was nine pounds, 11 ounces and a big baby. Yeah. And I ripped from front to back, I was in so much pain. I could hardly walk for about three months. And um, I was on opiates. They had me on, on first it was Tylenol 3, then it was Vicodin, then they diagnosed me with fibromyalgia. Then I was getting Vicodin and Soma, 100 pills, a bottle, 
with three refills, pretty soon I'll... <laughs> and, um, oh. yeah, uh, it wasn't long before. when I Then when I went to the club with taking all the opiates and then drinking a beer, <laughs> and... And then it started to become something I would go with my friends. And then one night I was like, let's go to the, well, in Hollywood, you know. And when I walked over there, we went there and it was my old hangout where I used to deal and do coke. And they're like, what are, where have you been? Oh. You know, and within 20 minutes I was doing cocaine. And that was the beginning of the end <laughs> Stop. So how long did it take you from, you know, first time going to Hollywood, friend invited, to the time when you're like, okay, back to your normal spot? How, how long was that? Like three months. months, six months? Maybe even in, maybe even a year. I don't know. It, you know, Satan is so patient. <laughs> it's like little step compromise, step, right? little mm. compromise, little compromise. Mm. And you start getting callous, you know, and, and, you know, first, like I would have a real conviction, you know, not to like, oh no, gosh, you know, and, and I can't do that or whatever. And then things become easier and easier when you don't repent and mm -hmm. you keep sinning. It's just like, well, it's not that bad, you know? And yeah, it's just, and then all of a sudden it just hits you and it's like, now I'm so in the gutter, I don't even know how to pull myself back mm -hmm. up. And so by the time I went to, started going back out to my old hangout in Hollywood, I came back one day and um, my husband at the time was like, I'm leaving you. Like I was so drunk, I was, he had to help me carry, carry me up the stairs. And I told him like, I slept with somebody else. Like I was just a horrible, like I wanted to get out of the marriage, but, and he, he actually was serving God, but you know, we both didn't know what we were doing, but he was like, he would try to pray for me. He'd be like, pray. And I'm like, get off of me, go pray in the prayer closet. <laughs> don't pray for me. I don't want you to pray for me. But yeah, it was awful. And, um, and I felt like the only way I could get out of it is if I just told him, you know, and yeah, it was, it was awful. And, um, I came home from work one day and he was like, I'm leaving you. I'm taking the baby with me. I'm canceling. I canceled your credit cards. I canceled the car payments. I canceled everything. And we found an apartment. And when he said that, I lost it. I went upstairs, got a, some of my clothes, and just dumped everything in the car and didn't look back and just went back out. And I was out for like six years and started doing heroin. And that's a whole other story. <laughs> I don't want to be too long. For so did your mom knew what you, like around that time when you went back on the street? And you were still young in your early 20s when you did that, right? Yeah. My mom my my mom and my mom was devastated. Yeah, my little sister. I just really it was awful. Like I just my little sister and I were really close and she really looked up to me and and she and my son were so close. I mean, you know, she's his auntie, but she, it was more like their brother and sister because they only had like, I think, eight or nine year difference, yeah. you know, in age. And it was just really, yeah, I don't know. My mom didn't even really notice mm -hmm. when I started abusing the drugs um, until the very end, you know, mm -hmm. and then, yeah. Cause I was like a functional addict for, cause off the pills for a while. Mm. And then, um, yeah, but once I started going, I started drinking along with the pills, it was all <laughs> and, and doing cocaine. Once I started doing cocaine, it was again, yeah, then it was, it was all over. And, um, then I lost everything really quick. I, I, I was working in a really nice sal hair salon and I was able to function for a little bit until I started doing heroin. 
And then when I started doing heroin, if when I didn't, it was one uh, night I had done all the heroin. I went to work the next day, didn't have any, and was sick. And I was I was dope sick, and I thought I had the flu. Um, well, no. The first time I got dope sick, I thought I had the flu. And then my boyfriend at the time said, you're not dope sick. You, I mean, you're not, you're not, you don't have the flu. You're dope sick. You don't have any heroin. And then when he gave me heroin, I felt better just like that. And then um, I was able to function for a little bit, you know, go to work just here and there, you know, as long as I was well, you know, if I had enough heroin. But one night I had partied all night and went to work with no heroin and just was sick. And I was trying to make enough money or enough tips so that I could like go and get a bag of dope and come back. And my boss, you know, working in salon, you see the mirrors and the mirrors everywhere. And I could see my boss in the mirror. And my boss is looking at me. And right after my first client, he called me on site and he goes, you are on drugs. And he's like, you can't work here like that. You know, he goes, if you ever go to rehab, I will take you back. And he goes, but you, you're, I can't have you here. And so I just, yeah. So okay. after that, you had to be on the street for, and you were on the street for six years? Um, yeah, I wasn't on the street street. I was like couch surfing from place to place, you know, whoever would let me stay with them. I had my car for a while, but then it got impounded. Um, yeah, and I was prostituting, you know, so that made some money or like I could, you know, just jump around and sleep, you know, but, um, I ended up after the six years, I ended up on Skid Row for, mm. for only a couple weeks. And that was, um. That was, well, oh, I skipped so much stuff. <laughs> well, during that time, I was very suicidal, especially after I'd been prostituting for about four years. Wow. I was like, I felt like an empty shell. I felt like every time I turned a trick, it was like I was giving away a piece of my soul. Oh. felt like the walking dead, literally. Like a zombie. Mm hmm I just had nothing left in me and I hated myself so much. You know, I just felt disgusting and, um, and I used to sit on the roof of my eight story apartment building and I would just be like, if I, this would have to be a sure thing, I want to, you know, jump, but like, you know, looking over, like, I don't know where I would land, whatever. And I would just, like, fantasize mm. about this. And, well, one time, one of the many times when I went to jail, um, when I got out, I found out that my best friend had slept with my, with my boyfriend. Or they didn't sleep. I don't know. They had something. And, um, and I lost it. And... Um, I, well, I don't know if I need to tell you the whole, well, anyway, so, um, I started planning, you know, and, but then he, we were like, well, okay, we need to stop using, you know, and, uh, we decided to try and stop and we, we went and we got a whole bunch of, um, Klonopin. I don't know if they're these pills. Um, they're pretty powerful, um, anti-anxiety, but like they're, they knock you out and almost like a tranquilizer, but, um, yeah. So we bought like 16 of those and then we, I wanted to go to church and, um, that's another, there's so much, I gotta <laughs> write a book, but anyway, so, um, uh, we went to church, we actually, got money from, from gullible church goers <laughs> and, and were able to get heroin on the way home. And he took one Kalanapin. I took one Kalanapin. We shot a bag of dope. 
he fell asleep and I guess I took the other 15 Klonopin, but I ended up going to my friend's house in Hollywood and doing this, I, I, I don't know, doing a lot of stuff. Then went up to the roof of our eight story apartment and either fell or jumped from the, from the roof. And I hit a tree on the way down oh. and landed on my head and I broke my skull, oh. I guess that's how you say it. I had to have brain surgery. Um, I, uh, I broke my ribs. I didn't break my neck, which was I'm so grateful for. And um, yeah, so I was in the hospital for almost a month with that too, but I, I was in a coma for, uh, I forgot how long, just a few days. I don't know if they put me in a, like, I, I'm not sure, but um, uh, when I woke up, I was like, where am I? <laughs> and um, my boyfriend at the time, he's like, well, apparently you jumped off the roof of our building. <laughs> he was mad. But yeah, I um, I had to learn how to read and write all over again. That just really sucked. I was just like, gosh, it was crazy because I thought I knew how to read and write. I mean, I thought, you know, I, I had the nurse take me to go get a magazine to read and I opened up the magazine and I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't know how to read. It was the weirdest thing. And I didn't even know my ABCs. I had to learn everything all over again. But, you know, determination, like, you know, I want to dope because as soon as I got out of the hospital. Really? Yep. That was, that was what was driving me. I just wanted to. So it wasn't to God, even though you were saved like a couple years prior to that. And the whole time though, I knew the Lord. And this is the crazy part because God would still talk to me when I was out there. I would be around people and the Lord would say, those people need me, but you can't even talk to them because of the way you're living. And I remember one, um, uh, this guy I lived with and his girlfriend, they got in this huge argument about God one day or one night. And I was sitting there cooking freebase at the table and they're arguing about the existence of God. And I'm like, oh my God, I don't even want to be a part of this conversation. And she's like, there is no God. And he's like, there has to be a God. And they're just going back and forth. And all of a sudden they both were silent and they turned around and looked at me and said, what do you believe, Lori? And I went, I just started crying and I was like, I know the truth. I know that Jesus is Lord and, you know, he died for our sins and da 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 And I go, but I'm living wrong. I'm the worst witness. I'm the worst example of what a Christian should be like. And I'm like, but I know the truth and Jesus is real and he is God. You know, <laughs> just so awful. Yeah, there was so many instances where... I just, I knew the Lord, I knew the Lord, but I just was in bondage. I could not stop. Your flesh was overpowering you, taking over you. Oh, I had demons too. <laughs> I'm serious. Like I needed deliverance. Like yeah. I didn't know anything about spiritual warfare. I didn't know how to fight, you know, and take authority, the authority we have in Jesus. In and yeah, so it was very hard to to like pull myself up out of that. But yeah, it was after jumping off the building and then um, I, tr I, I knew I had to stop, but I still couldn't. And so I went, um, but I went to a program mm -hmm. for a minute and was kicking. And then I, I was up for nine days. I couldn't sleep. And then um, I jumped out of the second story window there because I was like tormenting hearing voices. So this is the second time. Yeah, this Jump is the out. second time right, okay. I'm hearing voices and the, the voices were laughing at me, telling me, go ahead and jump. You don't deserve to live. You're this, you're that. You deserve to die. And I jumped out of the second story window and this time I landed. Um, well, I hit a, like a lawn chair, but uh -huh. landed on the cement and broke my back. Oh, <laughs> second, second time. Oh. Yeah. So when I broke my back... I didn't even think about it because I was so like crazy. And when I got to the hospital, 
um, I was screaming, give me pain meds. And they're like, we can't, we have to give, see if your back is broken because you might not ever walk again. And I was like, what? <laughs> and thankfully I, I can walk, but I still have, yeah. My junior was looking at my back the other night. He was like, oh my gosh, like you can totally tell you broken your back. Like it's all like, but, um, yeah, uh, I still didn't, it took me, gosh, it might have taken almost another year before I ended up on Skid Row again. Second time on Skid Row. Yeah. Okay. Wait. Okay. I'm trying to think. This, no, no, no. This is when I ended up on Skid Row for the, for the first couple time. weeks. Yeah. Okay. This is the first time. Yeah. But um, after all this this stuff, because I was supposed to go to prison, I was supposed to go, yeah, yeah I was in, and because of me jumping out of the building, when I went to court, my, my judge was just like, oh my gosh, I don't want to put you in jail. But I didn't have anywhere to go, and I'm, I, I walked, I was like, yeah, I don't have to go to jail. And then my friend that went with me, she's like, Laura, I'm not taking you home with me. You even need to go back to jail. And I was like, Oh my gosh. So I went back in the courtroom and I'm like, just take me to jail. <laughs> it's like, and wow. but he let me out really soon after that. But there's just so many things I, I it's hard to even keep track of everything. But but I ended up I was supposed to go to Teen Challenge, I think mm-hmm. it was. And um I left and then I was supposed to go to the was it the I went uh, to the mission. Um, oh, because no, they 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 were gonna kick me out of the the teen challenge because I was really mean to people. <laughs> but but um, uh, so they dropped me off at the metro station. I took the metro to um, downtown and I went to the Union Rescue Mission. And um, they had a curfew, so I was like, I don't want to get. You have to go to, you know what I mean? No curfew. So I happened to, it was like a week later. Um, there was, there was a Korean church that was, um, oh no, I'm sorry. Not Korean. It was, uh, uh, well, I don't want to say who they were, but anyways, there was a group of people that were, um, serving food and they told me they had a home like a women's home and if I wanted to go and so I ended up going back I I ended up going with them to the program and I left a week later ended up back on Skid Row and that is where the Lord was like I was like walking by on San Julian by the drop-in center. And I heard this is the only time I've, I I feel like I've heard God audibly speak. And he goes, Lori, look around. You're going to die a junkie out here anonymously. If you don't turn around and serve me. And it was so scary. The fear of God fell on me. I was just like, I was terrified. I can't even explain. Like I was just like shaking and I thought, Oh my gosh, I need to, I need to go, you know, back to that, that home. And, um, I thought that they were going to come back that night and they weren't there. And I, I was, I cried all night. I thought like God took his hand off me, you know, God will not strive with you forever. <laughs> like I was freaked out. And, um, my boyfriend actually took me back over there to mm. the home the next day. Mm. And um, so your boyfriend took you back to the home I was at. Okay. And I ended up being there for eight months. And um, were you clean then living? Yeah. There for yeah. Eight months? But and God taught me a lot through hell. I mean, and I don't want to go into that, but it was a really hard. <laughs> it was. It was Did awful. you have dreams and, and vision in, in the there. process of God was ministering to you? Did he reveal you through dreams mostly or through visions? No, you know what? Through people and through, like when I went to court, there was one time I went to court and, um, and the bailiff, I was in a wheelchair and the bailiff was, was wheeling me the 
different way than the normal way. And just out of the blue, he goes, do you know Jesus? <laughs> I was like, and I was crying. And he goes, you need to sur- turn around and serve God. And I was like, yeah, it was crazy. I mean, it was just what I needed at that moment. It was, And then when I was on Skid Row is when God said, you need to turn around and serve me. But um, there was just so many instances. Like m- one of my friends, her name was Victoria. She, um, she told me that she, we hadn't spoken in like a year. And I had always called her and at least checked in just to let her know what was going on. And she hadn't heard from me in a year. And she, she went to a retreat. She said that she was crying. She was like, God, I don't even know if Lori's alive. You know, if you want me to keep praying for you, you're going to have to do something because I'm going to give, I'm ready to give up on this. Mm -hmm. And she said the only time she's ever heard God speak to her. And he said, you may turn, you, you may give up on Lori, but I will never give up on her. Mm -hmm. And when she told me that I just broke, you know, because, and then she said, well, if you want me to keep praying for her, then I better, I need to see her. I need to see that she's alive you know, within the next month. Well, the next week I was loaded off my butt and my, I told my boyfriend, we need to go to my church. And I, I stumbled in my friend was hot. <laughs> and I went straight up to the bathroom because I, the, the conviction was so heavy, but Still, I couldn't deal with it, and I went straight up to the bathroom, and I went, and I, she came in the bathroom, she's like, Lori, is that you? And I'm like, hold on a second, I'm trying to find a vein. Like, I was just like, and yeah, I, I, yeah, and then afterwards, she took us to uh, lunch, and she was afraid I was going to get arrested. She said there was four deputies sitting nearby, and they kept looking at me because I kept, like, nodding out by my food, but... Yeah, there was just things that, that, or people off the street, you know, people would like come up to me and say something like, you don't belong out here, God has a plan for life, and you know, just, there was so many times like the Lord would speak through people and just let me know that like, I'm not giving up on you, Mm. and um, so when I left the place in uh, the women's home. I left because of just some drama I won't go into. And went, But I'd been clean for eight months. Mm. And then I went to my old church. And my pastor was like, oh, you know, that's great, whatever. And at the beginning of the service, he goes, I want, I want, to have somebody share their testimony and he handed me the mic and I'm like, Oh, so I start sharing. And then when I'm sharing, I said, God is a God of completion. He doesn't start something and not complete it. And when I was saying it, I was so convicted that I needed to, I didn't finish the, the program. (laughs) <laughs> and I was like, oh, my gosh. And as soon as church was over, I told my friend, I go, I left the program early. And she goes, oh, you should probably go back. And I go, I feel so convicted, like, when I was saying that. And then so um, I met with my pastor, and I told him that. And he goes, you need to go back and finish. And I was so mad. <laughs> so mm-hmm. It's like... I do not want to go back there. I hate that place. Da, 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 da. And I was just, yeah, I was not going to go back there. And But he's like, well, if you don't go back there, you need to go to another program. And so I tried to go back. I, I'll skip. But I tried to go back to the other program. I couldn't. And, um, and so uh, I called and asked if I could go to the, per, the place I jumped out of the window. <laughs> they're like, uh, you're a liability. No, <laughs> but they're, um, they gave me like 10 different phone numbers for places that I could go. The first one they gave me was the LA Dream Center. Mm-hmm. And I was like, no, I'm not going there. Like instantly, didn't even know about it. Nope, not going there. It was the last place I called 
And it was a place that I ended up going to and was just amazing. I loved it. Just learned more than anything. Just, I was ready when I went there. I was, I just sucked it up. I just, it was awesome. I loved it. How long were you and there? I was there for uh, 14 months, graduated, then stayed and led the prostitute outreach. We had a prostitute outreach back then. And, um, and I led that um, at three in the morning, we'd go out and um, wow. talk to the prostitutes. And um, three in the morning, three in the morning, every yeah. day. Uh, no, 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 no. On Fridays, Fridays. Yeah. And, um, yeah, you know, got married, had, uh, um, started our own ministry to How old prostitutes. Were you then? then by that time I was 40. No, not 40, 33, 34. I don't know. I don't know, my 30s. So the 10 years on the street, on Skid Row, after you got fired from your hair salon job, back on the that street. That was six so years. That's, so, right. Yeah. So by I the time you got I'm clean, started your ministry, that was like a decade later, right? I yeah, would say, give and take. There. Yeah, yeah. And then I was like speaking, and I had a lot of speaking engagements. I was going to different churches. I was teaching a class on like how to go out and minister to the prostitutes and stuff. And um, and about the game, the game of prostitution and pimp, oh. pimping and prostituting, like different, they have different rules and um, yeah, it's a whole lifestyle of, yeah, it's, they have rules and laws that, you know, um, like girls can't look at anybody, any man except for their pimp and just a whole bunch of things like they get disciplined. The, the, yeah. Anyway, so we ended up taking in, I ministered to a female for uh, about a year on, on the phone and her pimp was like ugh, awful. And I was afraid that he was going to end up killing her. And um, after much prayer, I felt like the Lord said to take her in. And so it was crazy. I like flew out to go get her and flew back with her the same day. And um, she lived with us for like 15 months. And I told you a little bit about that. I'm not going to go into that because it's another long story. But yeah, and then, um, but how do I say this? Well, you can edit it. <laughs> but she was involved with that satanic brotherhood and so and was a witch and but she got saved you know but there was still she had there was like a coven of people that still wanted her so they it's just like witchcraft curses mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff and and then i started well she ended up we were afraid because the pimp ended up coming out here. And so um, I didn't want to end up coming home and she's like dead or gone, you know, from our place. So the Dream Center took her in. Mm. And then, but she was really hurt, you know, but I was like, oh my gosh, I don't want you to end up dying here. So I don't know. Um, and a mu I ended up falling into sin, basically. I don't, I don't know how to, I ended up, um, compromise, compromise. Then I started taking pills like, because I had so many medical issues, they gave me opiates again. And then I started taking opiates and then, um, it was like the same thing over again. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, oh, I was talking on, uh, online to my high school sweetheart from when I was in the gang. He was in prison for um, 23 years to life, and we were just communicating. I, I let him. I he rededicated his life to Jesus, but wow. then it became like a to like an emotional affair, and um, and then I told my husband. And he, 
yeah, we just, it, it was like, it was like going through the exact same thing. I come home one day and he's like, I'm leaving you. I can't, it was almost exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. It was like a repeat. And so when, and I was too proud, I was too proud to just humble myself and go, I was wrong. You know, it was just, gosh, you know, I mean, I look back now, but there's no sense looking back because I'm so happy the way my life is now, you know, it's way better than ever, but you know, it's just the mistakes that I made that I can learn from now, but my pride, it was just so hard and man, I never want to let anything like my pride keep me from just repenting, you know? So yeah, I, um, we ended up, he left, I ended up, um, moving out. And then a month later I found out I had cancer and, (laughs) and a lot of people who knew what was going on around that time, because one of my good friends, she called me one day and she's like, worry, we need to pray. I had a vision or I can't remember if it was a dream or a vision vivid of the one head, witch. Um, sacrificing a young lady on behalf of me, chopping off like every organ and putting it in jars and cursing every one of them. And so we were breaking, breaking curses off of me, but it was like right after that I had cancer and, you know, an undeserved curse will not alight, but I had opened up doors to, you know, to the demonic and, and curses because I, of my sin and, um, yeah, but God's in his mercy, he still spared me. You know, I, I was able to go through the cancer treatment and everything, but, but they put me on fentanyl when I, um, after surgery and I ended up strung out on pills <laughs> and it wasn't long and I'll skip all the details, but it wasn't long before I ended up back on Skid Row. So three times, third time on Skid Row. <laughs> Is it three? So far, I counted. Yeah. <laughs> what did you just share? I think it's, you know, it's two, um, two. Two, okay. Yeah. But, um, yeah, and this time was when I met the love of my life. <laughs> but, no, this is when I, um, when I, the Lord gave me so many warnings. Like, I even had two ladies come and tell me that I was going to lose everything prophetically. Like, wow. if I didn't repent. And, wow. I mean, it, 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 God long strive. I mean, just patient with me. And I was just that hard. And um, I needed it. I needed to get humbled and just stripped of everything for me to, to just, I really needed it. I needed it. It's so interesting, Lori. Uh, you got saved. Um, finally, you 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 went to the the LA Dream Center. You got like again rededicate your life the second time. Uh, Travel to do ministry for the Lord, serve the Lord, preach everything. You experience everything. You experience His goodness. Everything, and that yet I I don't know how many years later you got back, you backslid, and then you went back to Skid Row the second times. Um, and then God sent his people to you at least a few times. And so you, like, he gave you everything, but yet somehow just the enemy, I, I don't want to say the enemy, but also your flesh is just like blocking you. Like you said, your pride is actually is the main thing. That's the number one sin. sin. Right. Mm. And I realized looking back to offense, and and uh, unforgiveness. I believe unforgiveness is the, the number biggest one. Mm-hmm. number one mm-hmm. sin. Prevent and the enemy. people from yeah, because Jesus said mm-hmm. if you want to be forgiven, you must forgive. Mm-hmm. And I had so many offenses and resentments towards certain people, and you could say you forgive, yeah. but it it has to be true forgiveness you know like yeah i forgive them you know what i mean but you see them and you're like mm. you know but 
it's taken a it's process, but the Lord has really shown me how important it is. Like, don't let it fester. When when somebody offends you, you need. I need to just like, I forgive. I forgive. I choose to forgive them right now. I'm not even gonna like let it obsess in my head, you know, because it all. It's like that saying, you know. Um, Bitterness is like drinking poison, hoping the other person will die. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't hurt anybody but me. But you're the first one who's going to experience death, not the other person when you drink, when you have yeah, all that. Yeah, totally. Because you brought death. poison to your own body. Yeah, it so. makes you miserable, mm -hmm. you know. And yeah, so that really kept, yeah, that that was a big thing that had that took me back out. And even AA says that, you know, resentment, you know, it'll, it'll take you back out to use. Wow. Yeah. And, um, but that was like, but God is so good because right what I told you earlier when, um, I, after I had lost everything and I was staying with a friend and, um, I was just, I was drinking i i didn't have any heroin because i was out in the boonies and um but i was tormented and i uh was in the hospital i i don't remember i have 51 50 i i can't remember if i drank too much or i threatened to kill myself or did something i've done that so many times but um i was in the hospital and i was looking out the window and i was like okay god i don't know what I don't know where I'm going to go. I've, I have nothing. I don't know what I'm going to do, where I'm going to go. I don't know anything. And um, he said, you're going to end up on Skid Row. And he said, you're going to suffer. You're going to go through many trials. But you're also going to meet your husband. And, I, and literally, it just makes me laugh when I think about it. Because I was like, what? Oh my God. <laughs> Gee, thanks a lot. Pick me a winner, why don't you? You know, I was just like, who am I going to find on Skid Row? You know, I really thought that. Like, what am I going to meet? Like, a drug counselor? Or, you know, I'm trying to think, like, how, you know, I'm not a pretty woman. Like, I never go out with a trick. Or, you know what I mean? Because I'm like, what kind of person am I going to meet out there? I'm not going to be with another dope fiend. Or, you know, I just had no idea. But I knew that I knew that I knew that it was God. I knew with. Just like I know the sun's going to rise every day. I just knew it was God. And so I, it stayed with me the whole time. I Well, we went, my friend, when I got released from the hospital, my friend goes, I'm not, I can't take you home with me. Because, yeah, I did something and the landlord's like, don't let her come back. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to have to You're on the you. blacklist. <laughs> yeah. So she's like, I can't bring you home. I was oh. like. Okay, she goes, the um, only place I'll take you is, is a program. So I go, well, if you're going to take me to a program, like, will you get me a bottle of vodka? So Because I don't want to go unless I get drunk, you know, because I don't want to go. So she was like, no, I don't want to do it. And I'm like, I'm not going to go. If not. You know, so she bought me a pint of vodka. And then we go inside, and the, and sh the intake woman's like, when's the last time you did anything? And I'm like, oh, in the parking lot. <laughs> She's like, we have a new rule that you can't use anything for 24 hours. Before. I'm like, what rehab does that? But, you know, it was just, and she was like, I smell alcohol. And I'm like, well, yeah. So she's like, I'm sorry, we can't take you in. And my friend's like, where am I going to take you? And I go, well, just take me to Skid Row because, I mean, that's where I was going to end up, you know. Oh, wow. So she dropped me off there, and yeah, I was there for three and a half years. That's a long time. Yeah, living and that's where in you met tent. your future husband now. Yes, yes. Can you so can you talk about that process? Three yeah. and a half years on Skid Row, and yeah, but well, what time is it? Yeah, <laughs> um, short version. <laughs> yeah, as short as possible. Yeah. Uh, it was, I'd been out there for a year just, like, getting drugs. Mm -hmm. I had met people and knew. There used to be a store there that 
dealt was a front for a store, but they sold everything in the store and they would let you get high in the back of the store. And um, yeah, so I used to just hang out there all the time. So it was like, I knew where to get drugs and stuff. But when I ended up having to live there, well, I first I got a, a GR, you know, general relief, welfare, whatever, food stamp. Um, if you're homeless, you can get GR just like that. And so they give you like $200 right off the 221. And so, um, yeah, I got, I got that, but, um, I stayed at the wine guard. I, I, I can't remember how much it cost, but I bought a week worth being able to stay there. So, um, I stayed there for a week and then after the week I freaked out because I'm like where am I going to go like I never slept on well I had slept on the street but not there you know and so um uh yeah that was uh, I well actually I ended up taking like a bottle of pills and they took me to the hospital but eventually I had to stay out there and I was just I thought if I had 51 if I got 5150 they'd like get me housing or something they didn't and um I ended up God was still with me so good I met some people that looked out for me of course I got I had very a lot of horrible experiences as well, you know. I got held captive by a serial rapist, you know. I got, I've had knife, you know, yeah, just not uh, very near death experiences. I had the, I got kicked in the eye, got jumped by two guys, and I. I was blind in my eye for a good uh, couple years, and then I just, in 2019, I had surgery. I can see a little bit, but, like, I'm still pretty much blind, but at least I can see f figures, <laughs> and, um, uh, yeah, I had a lot of really horrible things happen out there, but um, I, I did... Uh, I, I knew that what had God had said, and I, the first guy I went out with, it was crazy. The first guy I got, I went out with, because uh, you know when God says something to you, it's hard not to go. Hmm, I wonder if this is, you know, <laughs> and um, and every one of them, I tried to get him to go to the Dream Center. Like, would you go to the Dream Center? Like, because that was going to be like kind of my fleece, like mm -hmm. you know, confirmation, mm -hmm. like, and no, and um, so you do. That's why yeah. like the future has been. Yeah. Well, yeah. the second one, the second one almost killed me. He like strangled me. He was a, uh, he had been a gorilla pimp. Oops, I hit the microphone. He, he had been a gorilla pimp. And yeah, he, he drank and smoked crack one night and just went psycho and choked me and broke my jaw, broke my ribs. And, um, yeah, uh, that was the scariest thing that ever happened to me, I think, ever. Like, he he said he was going to kill me. He said that, um, yeah, he was like, you see what I, I'll, I'm doing to you um, 500 feet away from the police department. He goes, imagine what I'll do. If, if you leave me, I'll chop you in so many pieces. No one would be able to recognize you. I mean, it was just, yeah. And um, and then when I was in the hospital, they wouldn't, they, they wouldn't, well, not they wouldn't, but they couldn't take me into uh, like a shelter because I was a heroin addict. And yeah, they couldn't deal with the addiction part of it. So, um, and I hid for months. Um, thankfully, he went to jail for a while. But then I went, I met Junior and... Um, and... Well, it was crazy because when we first met, 
When we first met, I he was a dealer. So I just went to go get dope, buy dope. And he was in this this electric wheelchair. <laughs> He was just rolling around on it, but he sold it. But I didn't know anything. Like, I was just looking at him like, what is this guy? I like, and, but I bought dough from him. And I don't, we don't even remember like how, well, the first time we went out, we, he took me to, um, I think it was Main Street, but in this little, I don't know what you call it, like a, shelter thing not shelter, like a, in the doorway or whatever and he had he had um, a basket and he had he had a ice chest he had snacks and <laughs> so cute and um yeah we actually we kind of became friends more first before we started like going out I didn't even remember and then because I was still prostituting that really broke his heart too. And, um, but, uh, I was so like, I don't want to depend on any man, you know, I'm going to take care of myself. And, um, yeah, he, he knew the Lord, like, or he knew Bible scripture and stuff. And when I was out there, I wasn't trying to let anybody know that I was knew the Lord, you know, I was backslidden and I was just trying to like, just get through life. And I wasn't going to tell anybody that, you know, I knew God, the dream center would come out to Skid Row. I'd see the dream center bus. And I'd be like, I didn't want to see anybody. I've had, I had people like one, one of the guys, he called my name first and last. You know, because I'm like trying to write, he's like, oh, and I'm like, oh, God. and, um, yeah, I couldn't get away. I, I had people come up and some guy I didn't even know. And he prophesied over me and just like read my mail. And it was just crazy. I mean, there were just times that like God would bring somebody in my life to let me know that he, he hadn't left me. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then, um, but like Junior said that I, I just dumped him or I broke up with him one day. Well, we had gotten an argument and he had a really horrible temper and would throw these tantrums and scream and tear things up and break things. And, and I was like, after having my experience with that guy trying to kill me, you know, I was like, I, I can't deal with the anger thing. That just freaked me out. So, um, yeah, I ended up with um, this other guy. And um, um, when we lived out on th on 10th and Stanford, we, uh, my friend Anthony and um, his girlfriend were staying in my tent. And, uh, and Teresa had gone to jail, um, for a while. And when she got out, she, um, she was only out for four days and every day she overdosed and the four times she died in my tent. And, um, that was like, I'll never forget that because I remember what she look like the way her position was she was gray and uh i i wanted to give her cpr but when i pushed on her chest she sounded hollow it was just the creepiest sound and i was like dude you gotta call 911 because i was like i i couldn't revive i i couldn't even oh <laughs> but um yeah so uh he called 911 Ambulance came, tried to revive her for a good 45 minutes and nothing, and took her to the hospital. And um, I just remember thinking, that's going to be me if I don't get right, you know. So I told my boyfriend at the time, like, like we're going to die out here if we don't get clean, you know. 
And um, I was like, I, I, he, oh, he was like, you mean you'd actually want to quit using drugs? And I'm like, well, eventually, yeah. Like, I don't want to keep, t- <laughs> I'm like, we're never going to find housing or get off the street if we keep doing dope. And so he's like, well, what should we do? And I'm like, well, I can pray. And I prayed deliverance over both of us. He literally got delivered. Like, it was crazy. Just quit everything. I was still like, you know, but he quit. And um, I got high a few more times. But within a month, we had housing. And, um, yeah, we uh, we got off the street. Mm-hmm. But then, um, and then I told you at lunch, like, yeah. And then my dad's like, you need to get married. You need to get married. And got Ended up getting married, but knew that wasn't... He wasn't the one. He wasn't. He wasn't. And um, things got way worse once we got married. Just all hell broke loose. And then he ended up... He got a job. He ended up going back out, using... He was talking to girls. Just, yeah, it just got way worse. And then... um, um, do you want me to tell the whole thing about him or just a quick, like okay. 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, I ended up separating mm-hmm. and then when, um, with the leading of the Holy spirit, like I knew that it was a toxic mm-hmm. atmosphere and, and, but the Lord really used that time for me. I would not have been able to deal with Junior the last year had God not showed me how to love unconditionally and, um, and how to pray and how to do warfare. And, um, but when he finally released me, um, I, I was able to move, um, and I lived in a hostel with a bunch of people for, uh, I think it was like seven months. And then God gave me my own place. Mm. And that time has been, it was like being in a cave or just refining, you know, I, I just like, well, uh, I needed deliverance Mm -hmm. is what, and when I first got off the street, I still heard voices. I still, every time I go downtown, I would hear voices telling me to go get high. And, and I, I did get high a couple of times and it was like the obsession was so strong. I, I, it would stop. Like there would be times where I'd be like, in the name of Jesus, I command you to shut up and it would stop. But then we'd come back, and um, so I started praying. I started fasting, and I was just, like, begging God, like, set me free. I can't deal with this. I can't deal with this. And I had started going to a church, like a charismatic church in uh, San Luis Obispo and with a friend of mine, and we'd been going for, I don't know, a month or so. And uh, one, one Sunday we were there, and... I was so fed up and I was sitting there and I was like looking at everybody and I was just like, oh God, God, it's like, I can't, I'm not, nothing's happening. Like God's not doing anything. And, and so I told my friend after the service, I'm like, I'm out of here. Drop me off downtown. I'm going to get a bag of dope. And we started walking out of the church and there was a woman standing there and she said, excuse me, can I talk to you? Hi, my name is and she goes, um, God has been bringing your face to mind every day this last week. And I've been praying for you. He told me that you're in a lot of pain and he wants to set you free. Can I pray for you? And I said, hell yeah, you can pray for me. I was like, I was like, I knew. And, um, she and a, another woman, they took me in a back room and they prayed and had me break. They broke curses and took me through repenting and renouncing uh, for like two, three hours. And she could see in the heavens and she, she was, she could see, like, she would know, like, you've been involved in this, you've been involved in that. And I was like, yeah. So she would take me through and I'd repent and renounce stuff. And, um, I didn't feel different. I didn't, 
notice anything. You know what I mean? It wasn't like, I even had, I was like, well, let's see if this works. You know, because I was just like, so, uh. and then when I got home, I was like, I feel lighter, but I didn't know like if anything happened. And then just like, after a couple days, my head was clear and I didn't hear the voices anymore. And I knew that I was free. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Praise God. Cause I was ready to lose it, you know, because I knew that either I could, I, there's nothing for me going back out. I would end up dying. There's just nothing that I knew I didn't want to go back to that, right. but I didn't want to live in bondage either. Right. Like I couldn't, I was like, your mind awesome every day. torment. Yeah. Every day. Yeah. So after yeah. that deliverance, you were set free completely Com until now. Well, I was set free from the obsession. I still drank. I still smoked cigarettes. I smoked weed once in a great while, but like, once I got my new apartment, it was like, um, I, I truly, I surrendered everything. I was like, God, I never want, I, I want to be holy. Mm. I want to be pure. I want to live holy for you. Like for, as an, as a heroin, ex heroin addict, like drinking and s smoking weed is like not even drugs, but it is, mm -hmm. you know, but I was like, <laughs> I'm like, um, you know, it wasn't like I was getting drunk or anything, but I was still using that as a crutch, you know, just like, like, um, hanging out with some people that I probably shouldn't have hang out, hung out with, play, you know, dominoes and just, you know, have mm -hmm. a beer or whatever. But, but it was because I was still not completely surrendered. But, um, when, it was, I don't know exactly what it was that, oh, and porn, porn, that was another thing. Porn, um, it, I don't know if it was like, well, I guess an addiction. It wasn't like I watched porn all the time, but enough, you know, and, um, and I remember, you know, thinking like every time watching porn you feel dirty you know and it's just like ugh. and I I remember thinking um god oh and I was reading like uh the pursuit of holiness you know um uh I read oh during the quarantine I think I read about 20 books you know I was just reading 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 and I was just like I want to be holy I want to be pure and watching porn and you know smoking cigarettes or doing this doing that you know it's just these little compromises that's not holiness you know and um yeah and I just made a decision like I think watching porn opens a huge open door to the demonic, you know, but, um, I haven't watched anything since 2019 or 2020, I'm sorry, 2020, but it was just like, like, God, I want to, I want to be free from ever even like picking up my phone and thinking about doing that ever again, you know? And he delivered me from that. And it's just been a process of where he's just like, He'll bring something up and it's like, this needs to be released. Don't do this anymore. Like, you know, but not in a way like a condemning way, but just he loves us so much and it's just for my good, you know, and it's not like he's taking something away. It's just, it's, it's, he's doing something good for you, you know, and it's just like, I don't know, just and freedom. Oh God, I keep playing with this. Sorry. Um, it's just freedom, you know, and, um, yeah, uh, yeah, but so now you're happily engaged to the future, the husband that God told you many uh, years ago. Yes. When you bump into him the second time. And, uh, so now you guys, I'm, I'm kind of fast forward the, the, yeah. the process of the story. So now you guys are getting married soon, I would say. Yes. yes. And so this confirmation from the Lord that he's the one that God chose for you. Yes. Yes. Um, ordained. Yeah. He's given us so much confirmation. Well, at lunch, I mean, 
I told you about um, dreams mm -hmm. and... Um, so you saw your, feet, your husband freak. Junior's face right when you pray? You saw his face? When what? You said that when you pray, you saw Junior's face, that God confirmed you that he's your future husband? Oh, no. It was no? when we ran into each other. Oh. And then when when I threw out that fleece and I said, if, if, if Junior's the one, then um, my ex will be okay with it. <laughs> And then I saw him the next day, and he was totally okay with Your it. Your ex was totally okay. Yeah, like weird, oh, totally okay. But, but not just that. There was just. I actually I had I have a podcast, but like there's so much happened during this last year mm -hmm. that I recorded everything mm -hmm. because I wanted to remember so I could write because I believe I'm going to write a book about it. And um, so a lot of it, like, I had to document it because there was no, I mean, we just went through some crazy things, you know, mm -hmm. after he went to the Dream Center and, um, and then left and then went, went back and then left and then went. And then it's just, yeah, and is going again January 4th. Wow. Yeah. So, um, but God has been so amazing and just shown me his love in such a way I've never known before. I mean, through my relationship with Junior. And Junior's amazing. Like, I've, I've never seen somebody transformed so much in such a short amount of time. Like, from, I mean, if you could have seen him a year ago, it was just like a miracle because he was just this, yeah, junkie. I mean, like, at it. I mean, and not to say he isn't still, you know, we're, we always were, we're, we have issues, you know, and we're all working mm -hmm. out our salvation. But yeah, I've just, I know that God has like, I mean, everything, he's, he's totally, Junior's like my perfect ideal, like I just prayed like, like Lord, the only, because right before I, I had said, I had written off ever being with a man ever again. I'm like, God, I don't care if I'm single for the rest of my life. I don't care, you know, and, um. And then right before I ran into him, I started having, like, it was crazy, like loneliness, like a longing to actually be with somebody. And I was like, where is this coming from? I'm like, Lord, you know, I am so happy with you being my husband. I don't need to be with anybody. And I'm like, do you want me to get married again? It was just so crazy. And I felt like in my spirit, like, yeah, you're going to do ministry and some other things that I believe he, he said. And I was just like, well, I don't know, you know, well, you're going to have to do it because I'm not really, you know, because I really, I was like, <laughs> I mean, it's almost easier being single, you know? And, um, yeah, but I'm like, if I'm going to be with somebody, he has to love you more than me. You know, he is going to have to be a man of God, a man after your heart, a man who's passionate, you know. And he told me that this person would be, you know, on fire and love Jesus. And and we would do ministry together. We'd go out on the street and and, you know, pray for people and pray for deliverance for and cast out demons and just like do all kind of, yeah, that he's going to use us. And, um, but he also said that that person's going to go through dream center too. <laughs> so I don't know. It was crazy. And, um, but as every day goes by, God is just like showing me like junior is truly like the man of my dream. Mm -hmm. Like, I am so grateful that God picked out my husband and not me. But seriously. I mean, you did try the previous time, so it didn't work out, right? Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, yeah, I didn't try very hard, but yeah. 
<laughs> but yeah, it's crazy. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful every day. I just thank God for him. Mm -hmm. I really, I'm so grateful. He's so awesome. He'll like, even when he's being stubborn or grouchy and like the other day we were going to go to a meeting and he was like, I'm not going. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay. He's got to teach me how to keep my mouth shut too. But like, yeah, he went into the bathroom and then I was like, Lord, if you want us to go and change his heart, you know, he comes out a little bit and he's like, I'm sorry, I'll go. <laughs> you know, but he's, he's so awesome because he'll humble himself. Even, you know, after he throws a fit or whatever, then, you know, he, he'll calm down and, yeah. And, um, and those, those temper tantrums are, are becoming farther and farther in between. And, Amen. yeah, the anger issues have, have come down quite a bit because, oh, boy. Uh, well, he got kicked out of the Dream Center the third time because he punched, he dropped somebody. So kick, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, because he didn't know how to control his anger, and he's really learning now. Yeah. So it's awesome. Praise yeah. the Lord. So what is the message that the Lord put in your heart to share with those that are watching your testimony today? Ooh. Um, the message I would give is don't ever give up on anybody as long as there's breath there's hope god never gave up on me after all of the crap that i've done you know i mean i've just and i've fallen away so many times you know it's just so god's mercy is so amazing that God, I could just screw up over and over again, and I don't want to keep I ever do that again, you know. But gosh, I can't believe how much like mercy, you know. I mean, if I was God, I'd be like, "You're done," <laughs> you know. But I think that because God showed me so much mercy, that's why I was able to show. Junior Mercy, when he's done some pretty <laughs> annoying things. No, I'm just kidding. But there's no way. I mean, and not giving up. Like, there are many times that I wanted to just go, I'm done with this. I can't, you know, I can't, I can't do this anymore. I mean, and just crying and just being mad at God and it, there was one time I was so mad at him and I was like I can't do this anymore well I told you in the car what, when he was like do you believe that what I've told you about you and Junior and I was yeah and I literally felt like he slammed his hand on the table or something and said well then stand by it stop being double minded stand on it and um, there was another time where we hadn't talked in a week and I was upset and and um, and I was crying and I said, God, I just, I can't do this anymore. I can't. This is just too much. And he said, Lori, do not give up. I promise you it's going to be worth it. And it's been worth it. It's been more than worth it. Yeah, I know that. I, I know without a shadow of a doubt that that Junior's the one <laughs> and that God brought us together. It's only because of him. Yeah. His grace and yeah. his mercy. Yep. He is so good. I love Jesus. <laughs> I'm just like, good. Yeah. Mm -hmm.